Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Maria Gorgo, and I work for the University of Penn State, that is known as Penn State University. I'm an educator from education. And daily, I work with production, people who produce, people who grow vegetables, fruit trees, uh, mushrooms with the green industry and landscaping. And my specialty is the basic uh, integrated pest management. I work in farms and new laws that came out by the FDA in 2011. The new act of modern nation of food. I make a lot of capacitation and workshops about it. And I work for the team of agriculture. And inside that team of horticulture. And also, I'm originally from Buenos Aires, Argentina. And when I came to the United States 20 years ago, I started to work with agriculture. And then I realized that there was a huge need to provide agricultural classes and capacitation for staff development for the new folks working in agriculture in urban settings and also for workers for workers in the fields. And when I started to work for Penn State, we decided to develop a lot of workshops, classes, and a lot of materials of education, like different sheets, publications in Spanish, to be able to help in this sense at the staff development of the development of producers that speak Spanish. So how you all know in Pennsylvania, we have a population like it happens in the whole country in the agricultural sector that is growing more and more. And now we have more growers who speak Spanish all over the country. So now we are trying to reach at this community, especially in Pennsylvania, but in the northeast of the country and other parts of the country as well, where, where our materials are helpful. After this introduction, I'm going to start with my presentation. What are we going to speak today? More about integrated pest management. What is that program? And then we are also going to give a quick introduction of what it is a pest and what are pesticides. Entonces, desde, desde el año 10, so, from year 10,000 before Christ, people in different parts of the world started to domesticate um, crops, the most important crops. And from the beginning, from the beginning of the domestication of these crops, like um, of uh, oats and, uh, and different kinds of crops, and from the beginning, pests have been a problem for growers and people in agriculture. And they understood that the pests were a problem, but they couldn't do much because they didn't have certain knowledge of basic notions. For example, the biology of insects, the biology of pests, so that they could then develop and implement tactics to um, manage and effectively manage these pests. So as you may be able to see here on the, on the screen, we see that in the year 1500, they start to manipulate to avoid pests. And in 200 AC, they start to change the, uh, the times of the year that they would seed. Um, 200 AC, the Romans started to use aerosol sprays for uh, pest control. And in 300 AD, um, 
in China, they were using biological uh, controls. And in the year 1200, they started using soaps. And then there were two moments in human history where pests had a huge influence on the development of agriculture. And what ended up happening in the history of the world in 1840, around there is when the potato blight happened and this caused a famine in Ireland. And the consequence of this was that millions of people and people in Ireland fled Ireland and went to different countries, countries like the United States. Where I'm from in Argentina, there's a lot of Irish people as well. So they left the country and Nowadays, there are more Irish people outside of Ireland than in that country. So it changed the makeup of that country. Another event that happened related to PES, what it was in 1860, 1878, where the downy mildew almost destroyed the French wine industry. Thankfully, they were able to um, conserve these uh, these um, grapes and they were able to grow them again. In other parts of the world, they conserve them. So nowadays, you know, with this whole thing with the coronavirus, with a pathogenic virus that attacks humans, we, we see the, and we're still feeling the consequences of this pandemic. So this relates to this plague So in the late 19th century, where when they started to use chemical products to control pests, they used uh, things like heavy metals, arsenic, lead, mercury. And this is known as the silver bullet because it was believed that there was this very simple solution to pest problems. But then we know that what happened is the adoption of the miraculous technology. But scientists in that moment, the only thing that they were trying to do at that time was to develop and create new chemical products, new pesticides, or to try to make the existing pesticides more effective. So they based all of these controls on only using chemical interventions. So so then there was this idea of generating a perfect and easy solution to controlling pests. However, in the decades of the 50s and the 60s of last century is when problems really began. Scientists started to realize that they were developing resistance in these pests. The pests were tolerating these pesticides. So they also realized that there were negative impacts on, on the crops that were not the target of the pesticides. And so, so there were these releases of secondary pests and wildlife was very affected. There was also a resurgence of pests when the natural enemies weren't there anymore to help control their existence. And then they also realized that there was so much pollution uh, in, the, in the environment, in the soil, in the water the water that is uh, below the earth. And they also realized that there was a very negative impact on human health. So then this concept of thinking, okay, no, there isn't this miraculous silver solution. Uh, people really started to change their thinking on this and realize that the 
the use of pesticides, the abuse of, of pesticides and the incorrect use of them, they had to change. Something had to change. So they started to try to learn a little bit more about the interaction between the crop and the pest that was affecting it at that moment. Once they started to understand more about the life cycle of that pest, of the life cycle of the crop, at which moments was it more affected or less affected? That's when they started to develop tactics to control and strategies to control that were actually more effective in controlling pests. That's how the Integrated Pest Management Program was born. So I wanted to talk a little bit about two things. I think I have to hurry up a little bit. I'm trying to speak slowly so that interpretation can happen, but I'm gonna give you two terms that are really important. One is bioaccumulation. This is a term that was um, kind of released into the world by Rachel Garza. She was a marine biologist and an ecologist. And the bioaccumulation is when the organism accumulates and stores chemical residues in its adipose tissue. So let's say we have a fish. It's in the water, it's in a creek. As the fish starts growing, it starts, it's gonna have a greater concentration of chemical residue, of pesticide residue because as it starts to um, rid itself of these residue, residues is it actually gets accumulated more. So we see the fish when it's young, very low concentration of pesticides. As it starts growing until it gets to adult, the concentration is a lot higher and you can see it in the darker orange. Basically, all these residues uh, store in the fat of the animals. There's another term that's called biomagnification. So here we're talking about, I'm gonna do it really quickly so that you can see it. We're talking about the food chain. Basically what happens is that the organisms that are higher up in the food chain eat the organisms that are below in the chain and as they do that, they start uh, increasing the pesticide accumulation. For example, we're in a creek. This creek has a, let's see, it's DDT, a, a pesticide that's called DDT. You know, it has low concentration of that. Maybe in that time, in the 70s, et cetera, we, we didn't have the technology to actually detect the presence of DDT. So. It's in the water. Then we get, we get the algae that are, start absorbing that presence of pesticide. Then we see zoo, the zooplankton that are eating that algae. And then we see the fish that eat the zooplankton. And then we have the birds that eat those fish. This bird is going to have a percentage of pesticides of 20 parts per million in comparison of how it started. So what this means is that while we go up the food change, the concentration of pesticides increases. So we have two things here, the bioaccumulation and the biomagnification. I wanted to briefly mention this book. Many of you have probably heard about it. It's called Silent Spring. And Rachel Carson wrote this. She was a marine biologist and basically Ms. Carson wanted the American public to realize what were the environmental consequences that they were having due to the misuse of pesticides. She did not want pesticides to be outlawed. She just wanted for there to be research and for people to start using pesticides that were less toxic. In that moment, you know, in that moment of that silver bullet solution, it was all pesticide, pesticide, pesticide. So thanks to this book, the use of DDT was prohibited in the United States. And also another direct uh, thing that happened was that uh, the, uh, the Environmental Protection Agency um, 
was created. Thanks for this need for uh, research. So what is IPM? It is a, an approach that is sustainable to achieve pest management. And this program combines tools that are biological, cultural, physical tools. And the idea is to minimize risks, to economic risks, health risks, environmental risks, and their negative impact. So super important in IPM is to integrate multiple tactics. The objective is to control pests in a way that's safer and more effective and longer lasting. Super key, something very key for a, a program is to emphasize the tools, the techniques that um, that are about prevention and not intervention. Uh, so not applying pesticides as the first uh, resource and recourse. So, and using something less toxic if it's possible. So we're gonna analyze each term in this. So integrated pest management, we'll start with management. M, is related to management. We have to try to suppress the population of pests uh, in a way that is economically viable and aesthetically viable, also to protect human health. What is key in the management of a pest? To identify that pest correctly and to understand its biology. That is the most important first step because if we do not accurately identify the pest, everything that comes after that is gonna be wrong. It's not the same a mouse than a rat. It's not the same way that we're gonna control that pest. Another thing that so I can't say that there's a problem here and I'm going to use a tool. What we have to do from the beginning, it is integrated because we have other types of pests. It could be a weed, it could be a plant, it could be an animal, or it could be domestic animals. And also because we have different types of practices and tools. What are some of these tools or tactics? Is biology an organism against another organism? The impact against the mice? Hello? The resistance to the host plant, it could be a classic um, resistance or transgenic. And then after that, we have other tactics that are mechanic is we would create walls or fences or different glue traps. And then we have legal barriers like quarantines, inspections of the borders we're still with quarantines but there's more requirements so people can come into the united states or other countries so those type of things they are tools to have integrated pest management and then the last thing is the use of chemical products pesticides pheromones fast i'm going to try to continue these are the, it is 12 and 33. What is a pest? This is very important because there's a lot of confusion and reality of what it is a pest. Uh, people think that a pest is an insect. An insect is any organism that is alive that is out of place, like an insect, a rodent, a bacteria, a plant. And the characteristic of this pest is that it spreads disease to people, animals, and plants. And they destroy the property or they're nonsense. So some examples are 
microorganisms like pathogens, bacteria, viruses, fungus, weeds, nematodes, the mollusk, those arthropods, and vertebrate animals that we are more familiar with them, like deers. What are some characteristics? Where do we find them? We can find them in natural systems, in the forests, in parks, in agricultural systems, like in the fields, in our production lots, in the animals in them themselves. If we have cows or a metropolitan system in apartments, in gardens, in apartments. And another thing that is really important about pests is the human concept. A pest could be a problem for me, but maybe it's not a problem for another person. So the level of tolerance that I have is going to be higher than somebody else has. There's people that see a little weed, a little plant in the grass. They are like putting Roundup because they don't tolerate it. I'm not like that. I don't have a problem with having a little bit of weeds. It is a level of tolerance that's different. And the other part is situational. It's not if it's a deer in the forest, but a deer that is in my garden eating my petunias, it is a pest. So what we have to do in this case with a pest is know, understand, how, what does it look like when it's when it's um, healed, when it's not sick, and then try to figure out what are the different pests, what are the pests of that plant that are most common, uh, what are the sicknesses it can have, in what time of the year is that plant more susceptible, and in what type, in what period of the plant is more susceptible. And in this image here, you can see this pyramid where you can see the different tools that we talked about later, cultural, physical, mechanical, biological, chemical. And we see in the base of this pyramid that we have the tools that are higher in prevention. And as we go up, it's the techniques that are bigger in intervention and more toxic. How does a program of integrated pest management, we have to establish like the threshold limits. We have to identify the pests and monitor as soon as possible. Then we're going to implement, we're going to implement tools or tactics of prevention and then if it's necessary, at the end, we're going to implement practices of control, control, chemical control. And this is concepts that are very important because in agriculture, in agriculture and industry, it's an operation. It is our medium for life. We have to make money to be able to have a salary, to be able to have an income and so we can sustain the farm. So we have to incorporate concepts of economy so we can understand to know when to intervene or when to utilize a tactic of control. It does not have sex sense to use $25 to put a pesticide if the damage that is by the pest is lower than $25. So we can incorporate concepts of economy as well. The level of economic damage, the cost of control, the cost of apply a pesticide should be the same as the amount of damage that is caused by the pest. And this is important to understand because then afterwards we have what is called the threshold, economic threshold, the action threshold in English, they say, to incorporate also in the economy 
of production because we have to be sure that we're going to intervene at the right moment and not at a point where it's too late. So I want to show you this graphic and I'm so sorry, it's in English. There is two things, the level of population. And then we have here in this point of the E, the level of population in this red line that is getting higher. So the population of the pest is going higher. It's growing in the axis X, we have the time. So as time goes by, the population of the pest goes up. And then we have two, two lines. Here is the economic, the economic threshold. And that point is when we have to intervene, control, because if not, the pest is going to continue to increase growing the population to a point where it's going to affect us economically. And when it gets to this point, it doesn't even have, it doesn't matter to interfere because the amount that it's going to take to control is going to not make sense with the production. So in uh, integrated pest management, these concepts are important because like we said, we have an enterprise. It is not only sometimes when we're talking about a little garden of a person, it's different. You may have a tolerance that is lower because you're not looking so much if there's a, if you're gonna make a lot more, but in the industry, in commerce, we have to understand the yield. So how do we do this program? We are going to establish the economic threshold, then we're gonna monitor. We're gonna do visual inspection. We're gonna think of trams, traps. We're gonna monitor time, climate. And, and these are the different tactics that we can use. And the cultural technique is the one that has the most prevention, like we showed in the graphic of the pyramid. And these are practices of management that are ordinary and routine, like preparing the, the earth, plan selection for that land, for that climate. When do we plant? When do we use mulch? When do we prune? When do we irrigate? When do we fertilize? When? How do we use sanitation? of the different tools that we have for cultivation, rotation of crops. All of these tools, cultural tools, are basically basic things that we have to do in the routine things. So then after that, we have the physical techniques, the tool, physical tool. In this case, we're talking about eliminating insects and egg masses with the hands manually, in the border of the plants that are sick, or use a hose to try to take them out of the leaves, or simply taking out the weeds. But generally, this type of tactics is effective only to a, a certain point, and then we have to use something else. Another type of technique is physical. When row covers in the rows, uh, the tree strips around the trees that we're using in this type of the country, there is a butterfly, a moth, lantern, spotted lantern fly, and they use bands around the trees with glue around the trees for the nymphs, for them to be able to be trapped there. We can also use bird nets and tree guards, fences. All these different types of tools are the ones that we know about protection, physical protection. Then we have the biological techniques. We spoke a little bit about this, 
but just some examples is the parasitic bees, like the lacewing ladybugs that could eat the aphids in the greenhouses. And basically, and the tactic, biological tactic, is to utilize biological enemies of the pest. And then last, like we said, in the top of the pyramid is the use of chemical products. And we said we're going to try to use them as a last resource. And when it comes to chemical products, there are certain terms that are very important to understand. One is of the chemical products of pesticide, they have a mode of action. And it's how does this work? How does this pesticide work to control the plants? What is the system for the organism that is attacking to control the pest? Is it the nervous system in the animals? Is it photosynthesis in the plants? Or is it in the animals circulatory system? What is attacking? A pesticide can also be active, that it only controls certain pests. It can be huge at spectrum that it controls or kills everything, like the lyphosite. And then after that, it could be systemic. Is it in the roots? Like is it growing the trees or in a plant? Or it could be that works at contact. It has to have direct contact with the pest. Another term that is important in understand it's like what it is persistence of a pesticide. And when those ingredients, active ingredients, are still there for a long time in the ecosystem. And another one is the use of pesticides, residual pesticides, because they stay in the environment for a long time. And that is why we don't use dexatoxalide, because they realize that for 30 years, it's still there. Yeah, but that's why after 30 years after they changed the use, we're still finding residues of this pesticide in the ecosystem. And then the last question that we have is what is a pesticide? A pesticide, if you divide the word and you put the word pest, pest or disease, and the other part is SIDA, homicide, suicide, that is to kill. Pesticides are chemicals that are designed to kill or repel pests. They're called insecticides if they kill insects. They're called herbicides if they kill weeds. They're called fungicides if they kill fungi. And, and uh, per, uh, rod rodenticides if they kill mice, rats. And then also if it's in a gas, uh, the fungicides or pesticides or rodenticides could be in a chemical compound at room temperature. And what is important here, uh, what we mentioned in the beginning, if we use pesticides constantly, incorrectly, we're going to end up with resistance that so what we're trying to control is is not going to work it's going to they're going to develop a tolerance to this pesticide we're not going to be able to control that pest as we had been able to do before so this is a little graphic that i think illustrates perfectly what happens when we apply pesticides uh, at doses that are um, not what is indicated in the label or their recommendations. You know, if you start to using a higher dose or if we use pesticides continually without rest, giving the crop rest. So in this case, we have uh, ant population, these ants. I don't know what happened, but it's not really showing the different colors. I'm not, I'm not sure why I think 
it got changed in a in a certain moment but i'm going to describe what what is it that happens half of these ants that i am pointing to right now are individuals that are susceptible to pesticides pesticides can control them these should show up as black in this slide then we have another group of individuals other ants that are resistant they should show up as black here in this image in all populations there are going to be individuals that are resistant to the pesticide so let's say that we apply the pesticide we kill the majority of the ants the ones who are susceptible but the ones who are resistant will survive certainly survive so later when when we still have this pest and we are not able to um, get rid of all of them, we apply again. And when we apply it again, oh, excuse me, sorry. I think that some slides are missing here. Maybe when we did the translation, it got messed up. But basically what happens is that when an organism that's susceptible and an organism that is resistant, um, reproduce together the next generation half is going to be susceptible and a half of the of the offspring are going to be resistant so what we're doing is that we're actually going to increase the number of resistant organisms with every pesticide application therefore in a program of integrated pest management we have to use new pesticides, new formulations, new chemicals um, to change that uh, uh, resistance. We have to have, also have to change the, the pattern of application. And of course, we have to follow what the label and the instructions of the, of the container of the pesticide say. All right, thank you so much. into uh, some of the principles and concepts of, of IPM. Uh, if anyone does have any questions for Maria uh, based on her presentation, or if you have any questions for Alejandro during his presentation, please go ahead and, and just write those in the chat. Um, we're going to quickly turn things over to Alejandro Calixto, the director of the New York State Integrated Pest Management program who's going to share a couple of examples of how to apply an IPM program specifically in organic vegetable crops and in this case um, organic cucurbit production. So Alejandro, thank you so much. Thank you, Ethan, and good afternoon to everybody. It is a pleasure to be here. As Ethan mentioned, I am the director of the integrated pest management program of Cornell University. And my training is in entomology. I have worked for many years with invasive species in Texas, in Florida, and particularly with ants. Recently here in New York, ever since I joined this program, I have been working with the spotted lanternfly the spotted lanternfly that has just gotten here to New York through Pennsylvania. So I'm gonna speak very briefly uh, about the integrated pest management in vegetable crops that are organic. I'm gonna cover these things in this presentation. I will talk briefly about organic agriculture. I will then focus on integrated pest management in organic crops. I will talk about a couple of pests, insects and diseases. I will talk about two insects that are key in the state of New York and two diseases that are also very common in this area. So a little bit of information for you in terms of IPM and organic agriculture. Agri Organic agriculture is a way of producing food that promotes and improves the well being of agricultural systems. This includes biodiversity and biological cycles. The success of organic agriculture depends on 
all of these practices, agronomic and adequate practices, and it includes the adoption of integrated and sustainable pest management, organic agriculture and integrated pest management aim both towards the conservation they emphasize the optimization of natural resources, ensuring that profitability and sustainability are maintained of the crops. This includes reducing different kinds of risks related to pests and reducing the risks of their management of these pests as well. Something that Maria covered really well in her presentation and her introduction to IPM is that we, with integrated pest management, we're trying to establish a biological resistance. Imagine, just imagine a forest that is conserved. It has all these species of plants, all these species of insects. It's super balanced. Just imagine it's this web, like a spider web with all of these uh, threads that are super strong. But then uh, if you remove those threads, that that web becomes so weak. And that's what happens with agricultural systems. We have all of these species in uh, agricultural land, and we are reducing natural resistance when we eliminate the diversity. And so a lot of the practices in organic agriculture are leading us to promote the conservation and the optimization of the natural resources that already exist. That's what organic does. I'm not going to emphasize this too much in terms of integrated pest management because Maria did an excellent introdu introduction. But I do want to highlight the concept of what is the definition of IPM. It is a process of sustainable decision making based on science and research that has happened for so many years and that integrates tools that are biological, cultural, physical, chemical. And we're always trying to be in the side of prevention rather than intervention. While we, if we move more towards intervention, that's where we increase toxicity, risks. That's the stuff we want to prevent in our agricultural systems and in general. So now that we start to deepen a little bit into this theme, this is what I have to share with you. IPM of insects and diseases. I will focus on cucurbits. You know, this is really common in New York and in agricultural systems in the state. The first pest I'm going to talk about is striped cucumber beetle. This is a beautiful insect. It's small, but it is so problematic, not only in the north of New York, but also in subtropical areas like in Florida, in parts of California. This slide is going to show the life cycle of the striped cucumber beetle at this moment. This insect is hibernating as an adult, so it hides in the leaves. As the weather starts getting warmer in the spring, the insects start to migrate towards the crops. They start to feed on the leaves, and they really cause a lot of damage in the plants, in the seedlings of the crops. This insect then lays its eggs at the bases of the plants and on the leaves. And after you have planted, you know, depending on the season, if it's uh, the spring, they can really damage the new seedlings a lot. If it's later in the spring, it can also cause a lot of damage in the foliage of the plants. After they lay their eggs, the adults start to uh, emerge in the summer and they start to to cause damage that's considerable in the crops and the cycle keeps going and starts again in the winter they start to hibernate again as adults and that whole cycle repeats itself these are two examples on the left is a seedling of a cucurbit 
that has been really damaged by that beetle. On the right, we have the damage to the stem. That stem damage is really considerable. I mean, it practically kills the plant. As you know, cucurbits cannot uh, heal themselves once the stem has been damaged. Another of the problems with this insect is that they can um, spread a bacteria and it is a systemic bacteria and it moves in the vascular system of the plant. So it basically causes premature wilting of the plant and it ends up killing it. This is really common. You can observe this often. This is a crop where this plant has been attacked by this beetle. It has been infected with that bacteria. So some of the practices uh, of integrated pest management that we suggest in this zone is cultural management. The first one, of course, is trying to find plants that are resistant or at least le less attractive to the beetles. This is easy to say, but hard to practice because there are many plants that maybe are resistant, but they don't actually produce a yield that's super productive, that's a high yield, or the fruit isn't super attractive to then sell at the market. But there are certain resistant plants that have been uh, bred better and, and they make it less likely to get this beetle. Another tool is to use, um, uh, trap crops in the perimeter. And so we can use other um, types of crops that are also cucurbits and, and plant them at the perimeter. And this works well if you have a lot of acreage. Um, and in systems that are really small and you don't have that acreage, then you, if you have, then you have to really conserve those perimeter plants and you have to take steps to reduce the number of insects in the perimeter because they could move from the perimeter to the crop. And another tool is the use of covers. This is basically um, really shield the plants from the insects and they provide protection to other insects uh, and even other diseases that could move on to the crop. And then the chemical, um, the chemical management of this beetle, um, you know, generally it is um, effective to to use these steps. But as Maria was mentioning uh, in her presentation, some of these insecticides have so much risk because they're used; they're not rotated. Uh, and and then we create resistance and they stop being efficient. So there is a compound that's called kaolin clay and the commercial name is surround. And this is practically a dust that is applied onto the plants um, and, and this striped cucumber beetle in particular does not get attracted to the plants. It's actually super effective. And I've had experience in the South, in Florida, in Georgia. Um, for white flies, it's also very effective. And it can provide a certain protection to other uh, diseases. But the problem with these compounds is that you can imagine if you have a really wet season, like the one this past summer, these compo these you know th this spray is going to be removed so quickly and you're going to have to reapply and now we're going to move to a management that is key in the management is the insect of the cucurbits the squash borer this type of insect like an adult in the spring, it starts to migrate towards the crops and they start to quickly eat and they eat the fluema that it's the liquids that the plants have and they start to deposit the eggs under the leaves. There is a picture here that I can show the eggs of the squash borer. Um, it's very unique and peculiar, and it is very easy to identify. And as they get bigger, these 
insects keep eating from the plant, particularly from the leaves, and in the summer, particularly when it's really hot and there's not a lot of rain, you can see large numbers of these insects infesting these plants, and in some cases, debilitating the plant and killing them. And how I indicated, um, in the winter, it invernates like an adult. The important thing of these um, crops in the management of pests is the part of healing, trying to remove everything that you left from the previous crop because all of that provides a house for these insects. And then they're able to invernate, they're able to hibernate, and we wanna reduce the how many they reside in the winter. So when you start to plant in the spring, you don't have as many problems. These are going to, uh, some of the pictures that I showed you. Reality, when they go to the stem, that is practically, it is, they exterminate the plant. The plants do not recover from that. They debilitate, they die really quickly. And then you're also going to see the damages in the leaf. They have a system in the mouth, estigneta, and then it's like a needle and it ruptures the leaf. And as it gets to get debilitated, they leave saliva and you see that yellowing. And then it just wilts that the insect has been feeding from the plant. Some of the recommendations that we make for the management for integrating pest management for that insect me mechanical and cultural is the crop rotation. It is very important. So many of these pests, they like several different types of crops and plants. So if you try to have rotation of the crops throughout the year and you pro provide other plants, they are going to be in other plants and then they're not gonna have that damage in the crop there is some people that use wood in the soil at night and they're like a trap and they like to, you create a microclimate that is a little bit warmer at night when it's colder and they move underneath these planks of wood. And then what you can do first thing in the morning is to go and check the planks of wood and practically destroy them, like squash all those insects before it starts to warm up in the day. In the night, like all the insects, the metabolism goes down, it slows down. And for that reason, in the morning, as soon as you wake up and you oh, go over to the fields, to the crops, you can lift up the straps and then quickly kill these insects or they start to move really quickly. And the other one is to look around, what Mariel was talking about is look for the crops and look for eggs. If you find webs, destroy them. The eggs destroy. That is the recommendations that we're giving. And the chemical management, there's a couple different ways that we go about for organic culture is neem oil, parenthas, parenthens, um, the mix of neem and pyrethin, and you can mix them in big tanks or in the products like acera, that is already pre-mixed for you and you can applicate it into the crop. These products are not completely effective. They work really well for eggs and for the nymphs that are the young stages of this insect, but for the adults, it's a lot more difficult to be able to control it. Generally, the, nemata, the nematoids are more, the parathens are more effective, but I wanna repeat that if you don't do rotation with the insecticides, you're also gonna have resistance. And then what you're gonna create is a more difficult um, situation to be able to manage. And now to move into diseases, the two that I have is the powdery mildew. The powdery mildew that is the most common Arisa cicromato, the downy mildew. I'm going to start with the downy mildew, which is a sickness that attacks the curcubites, the cucumber. The first symptoms that we have is this little yellow dots in the leaf. And this is a sickness that if you're not ahead of it, practically is going to destroy the whole crop. 
one of the things that we always say in the integrated pest management is that sickness don't create the conditions try to reduce the conditions for the symptoms for that sickness so the illness doesn't reproduce in the in the crops temperature humidity and irrigation if you have all these conditions in your crops and your the way that you cultivate you this is going to change and these things are going to reproduce and are going to infect the plants very quickly and practically are going to kill the plants they're going to wilt and it's going to kill a lot of your crop the cycle of this disease is very interesting and I'm an entomologist, and I also done a lot of work in pathology of plants before uniting with Cornell. And what I say is that if the inoculant is present, you have the solution. They're going to move fast in the crop. They like the crops that are healthy. Obviously, in crops that are organic, you can pay a lot more attention to your crops. And while you're moving and while they're more the crops are healthier and greener they have good irrigation and all of that but if there's not a lot of air aeration and there's a lot of humidity they're going to be infected easily they're going to reproduce and they're going to cause more of this damage quickly there is a couple of different managements that i want to share that are cultural management that is plant resistance this is a variety MR401 that is resistant. And to the right, there is another cultivar that is completely susceptible. So the resistance of plants works, works very well with pests, with disease. It's finding the appropriate one for your zone and for that type of pest. Another form is, that is a cultural form, it's excluding the spores using, practically using greenhouses, tunnels, where you're protecting the crop. Obviously, inside those greenhouses or tunnels, you have to be very aware because you're going to have the optimal conditions so these diseases can reproduce. You have to always be aware that there's good air coming through, airflow. That is a system of filtration that captures the spores. Or if not, you're going to create the perfect stage space for these diseases in these greenhouses. So the management chemical, the chemical management in organic, there is a lot of biopesticides. There is a lot of chemicals, traditional chemicals that can help you to suppress this disease. There is two types of fungicides. Some they say is for protection and some they say is to rescue practically the crops. You can, like I say, don't fully trust in the fungicides, but trust in the other practices that we mentioned. And if you see that disease, it is important to detect early on so you can take on the action and contain that problem in that crop. These are some of the products that are registered for this disease in the curcubits. These are some of the biopesticide, actinoid. And like I mentioned, that it has been used a lot in the past for managing disease. Monitoring is so important in the integrated pest management. There's a lot of different systems in the internet. This is an example, where is the IPM pipe? That is a system that predicts sicknesses for curcubits, uh, particularly with the mildew it is there, the code, QR code that you can use to access this space. And that is gonna give you information in real time of what is saying in what situation is that disease and where it is. And then you can take the appropriate action to be able to contain that disease. 
So now moving to the powdery mildew. I also want to say it also attacks the curcubits, all curcubits. It starts like a little white dot powder that is over the leaves. It weakens the plants, not as often as the other mildew, but it can cause also that wilting or that the fruit's ripening a lot quicker. The pumpkin, the squashes, the summer squashes are very susceptible to this mildew. And the early detention is so important. Here on the left, you can see an example of a leaf that's been very infected with this mildew and the cycle is very similar. It has two stages of life, but practically is not creating the conditions for this pathogen to be able to reproduce in the plants. So plant resistant, I keep insisting that is a part of prevention. This picture shows you two examples. One of the lines, it has plants that are susceptible to the crop. All the mildew is on those plants. You can see that, but right next to that line crop of curcubats, you can see a line of plants that are resistant. It is so impressive to see the difference between these two varieties and resistant is very important in preventing this mildew. Like I say, not creating the conditions, not creating the conditions for these pathogens. This is an example that we use here in organic cultures. So the straw mats, they're not only providing protection from another pest that is weeds that I'm not going to talk in this talk today, but it also keeps the humidity from the ground. It, re it reduces the humidity that is coming up from the ground because usually infection comes at the bottom of the plant and it moves up. All these different practices helps reduce the spores that are gonna create and move into the crop. The picture doesn't show very well, but there's a lot of really good space between the plants. I know that sometimes it's difficult. You wanna maximize the space, the number of plants that you're cultivating. But if you give them space and you provide that space so the air can move through the plants, that is also going to, to prevent the existence of spores. Some of the other biopesticides and also traditional chemicals as a sulfur, um, sulfuric acid. Some of them are effective and they can control up to 90, 95%. It is important that also, like I say, is you have to be very aware of monitoring the crops and seeing the beginning of this infection. Take the necessary actions to contain and try to contain this epidemic in your crops. This is what I have for today. I don't know if y'all can use your phone with the camera and come closer and come to the QR code. And that is going to take you to do a little survey. If you have time, please, if you have time, I would love to have some feedback on the presentation, but the presentation that also Maria gave. And also I wanna be sensitive with time. I know that is 115, and this is the last um, slide that I want to leave you with. And the messages that I want you to take with you in these two presentations is the organic agriculture and integrated pest management. They both are trying to have conservation and optimization of natural resources and reduction of risk to people and the environment. It is important to understand and adopt the basic principles of IPM to successfully, how Maria presented, to prevent and control with success the different types of pests, of insects and disease and weeds, et cetera, et cetera. And remember that the focus of integrated pest management is prevention, not intervention. We have to start at that phase of resistance of plants that are resistant, monitoring, biological control. And also remember that the use of pesticides is the last resource we wanna take that is intervention already. 
when you get to that point, the toxicity increases, the risk increases that you lose the crop, that you're going to be exposed to pesticides, the risk of exposing pesticides to the environment. And that is all I have. Thank you for the invitation and thank you so much for the attention. If you have any questions, please, you can contact me. And here's my inf the information about our website, the Integrated Pest Management of Cornell. Great. Thank you so much, Alejandro, for your presentation. Um, if, if folks need to hop off, you can go ahead and do that. I am going to launch another poll very quickly. And, and again, uh, it's not absolutely necessary that you participate, but uh, your participation does help us again uh, report back to our funders on, on the importance and impact of, of this work. Um, if, if participants do have questions for either Maria or Alejandro, um, if, if Maria and Alejandro have a couple minutes to stay on, um, we, we do have uh, one uh, question that is already in the, the chat that I can read out loud from uh, Mandy. And Mandy was wondering, how much does soil health and, and soil composition help protect plants from pests? Maria, I don't know if you want to answer this, but what I will say is that it's really important. I mean, remember what I said about restoring the complexity and the resistance in agricultural systems. The restoration of that complexity has a lot to do with the soil. There are so many organisms, other insects, other pathogens that are beneficial and they promote the uh, they're promoted by the integrated pest management and they can really reduce the risks in um, organic systems. Oh, yeah, I had already answered it in the chat. Basically, soil health contributes to the plant being healthier, that it can grow better, that it can resist and tolerate more of the pressure that comes from pests. So yeah, it's very important. Soil health is super crucial. Great, there's, there's also a question from Lori in the chat on any thoughts on using tin foil cuffs to prevent squash vine borer nymph burrowing. So it's, it's a practice sometimes used on a smaller scale for um, folks who are not familiar of, of wrapping kind of the, the base of the, the plant in, in foil to exclude those um, squash vine borers. Any, any thoughts on efficacy? Uh, it's a really good question, Lori. It depends. You have to be really aware of the temperature. If it's too warm, those seedlings and that um, stem can be burned by the tinfoil. It could burn the plant. So you have to make this decision depending on the temperature that um, that's in the atmosphere that moment. If you're doing it in the middle of the summer, I'm not so sure. But if you do it in a season that is not so warm, then it is going to provide a certain amount of protection. Really important is that when you roll it, make sure that the stem is very sealed close to uh, close to that stem because if there's space, water can come in and that could end up um, promoting the growth of disease on the stem. So it works, but you have to be really careful of how and when you are using this intervention. I'll just add really quickly too, we don't have a monitoring network for squash vine borer flights in New York, but um, other states in the Northeast do, especially New Hampshire, um, where some of the giant pumpkin growers uh, who do it sort of competitively are, are really concerned about squash vine borer damage. So we often use the data from surrounding states to kind of inform decision making on, on when to use, you know, uh, if you wanted to use that cultural control tactic that, that you're bringing up with using those cuffs for just a shorter period of time during peak flight um, or some chemical control strategies as, as well. Um, there, there is uh, another question. Um, 
se va a enviar la grabación de esta presentación para Will que... you send the recording of this uh, so I can share it with uh, my coworkers on the farm? Of course, Marguerite, as soon as it's ready, we will share the recording with you in Spanish. We could we'll also share the English recording. I to mention that uh, our next workshop in the series will be on January 12th. We will be sending out a reminder for that. That workshop is going to focus more on appropriate nozzle and sprayer selection um, for smaller organic farms. Um, so we have uh, uh, two speakers for that. Uh, Ana Maria Arce from TJET Mexico will be joining us, as well as Justin Devao from the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture for that presentation. So again, um, we will send out a reminder for that meeting. Um, another question has come into the chat. Um, can you elaborate on the timing of spraying? Since we want to prevent and not spray unnecessarily, let's take cucurbits, for example. Should you spray before applying row cover or after uh, removing while fruiting or, or during the pollinization of, of flowers for fruit set? Muy buena pregunta, Erin. Very good question, Eric, and the answer is a little long. I want to start by saying that it depends on the compound you're going to use. You're, you have to read the label. You have to read the fungicides label because some fungicides recommend to apply um, like to protect the plant. So you might even have to apply before you even see symptoms. But with other fungicides, you might have to apply it after you see start seeing the symptoms, but early. Some restrict the use if they are already flowering or when the fruit is already growing. So you have to be really, really careful to read that label um, that the fungicide container has. In terms of diseases, it's really important um, to not be caught with your pant down, pants down, like we say in Colombia, because if that disease starts to affect that plant, all, then it's going to be really difficult to control once it's already established. So with crops that are that are at risk, and if you have a history on your farm of a certain disease being present, the, the likelihood is that you will need to actively monitor and you will have to apply fungicides as a prevention and protection, or you're going to end up with problems in your crops. Are there any other questions for either Maria or Alejandro? If so, uh, you could go ahead and enter them in the chat quickly or, or unmute yourself as well and, and just go ahead and ask. I can also leave my email address if anybody wants to contact me in the future. Please go ahead. If you have any questions about our um, Penn State educational resources in Spanish, um, please go ahead and contact me as well. All right, well, we're well, seeing that there are no other questions. Uh, Maria and Alejandro, muchísimas gracias por compartir este. Sus Thank you so much for sharing your presentations today. And for everybody who participated today, thank you. And I hope that we can all see all of you uh, January 12th for the next workshop. And take care. Thank you, Ethan. Merry Christmas. Bye. Thank you.